Hey everybody! Today is Wednesday, and this this crazy thing is a whiteboard. That means it's time once again for Whiteboard Wednesday. Good to see everybody here. Great to uh I love Whiteboard Wednesday and I love Sundays because it's a time for me to uh not have to think about, worry about, or talk about coronavirus or Anything that's going on politically speaking, we can talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. Always warms my heart. Warms the cockles of my heart. I love that saying. Makes people uncomfortable when I say that saying, but uh, that's why I enjoy it so much. Great to see everybody here. Uh, if you're if you're there, feel free to say hi. Pop a, pop a question in. If you have a question, we're going to jump right into it, though. Uh, I got a great question from last week. We talked about the timeline of Jesus and everything that uh, kind of uh, Jesus is... Uh, well, the four Gospels and the, the timeline of, of Jesus's life and his ministry. And one of the questions we got is, why don't we have anything from Jesus uh, as a child? We know about Jesus as, uh, as an adult and uh, everything that happened to him. Why don't we, why don't the Gospel writers tell more about, uh, about Jesus as a kid? Why don't we hear anything about that? We don't have much about Jesus as a kid. The only thing we know is where how he was born, right? And uh, and then we get a story about how King Herod uh, heard that a baby was born and went to kill all the babies that were born in Bethlehem around that time, every, everybody two years old and younger. And so Jesus, who was a young boy at the time, and Mary and Joseph, uh, Jesus would have maybe around two years old, they went to Egypt and uh until the until everything died down and then they went back home to nazareth the only other story we get is when jesus is a little bit grown up uh at 12 years old and the his parents go down into jerusalem and for a fest a feastable feastable a festival and um they 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 lose him there little uh jesus about 12 years old is there at the temple but then that's all we uh they had to go back and get him that's all we know about jesus um Hey, good evening, Teresa. Good to see you. So why don't the gospel writers tell more about that? Well, I don't exactly know why they don't tell more about it, except that uh, the four books we have about Jesus, Matthew, ooh, Mark, Luke, and John, are all intending to write um, biographies. That is, if, you're, if you go to school and you read a... Uh, a book, an ancient work, one of the questions you ask is, what is the genre of the work? That, that's going to help you understand what, the, what they're trying to tell you. So if you're reading the Iliad, that's some kind of, it's an epic, right? Or if you're reading uh, uh, the Rime of the Ancient Mariner, that's a poem, right? And it's important to know the genre if you're going to understand what they're saying. What is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Uh, they are the genre of biography. Now, a biography today is, has different rules than a biography did uh, a long time ago when Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote. So a biography today, uh, you know, th there are certain ways that biographies tend to look. Back in the day, if you were writing a biography of a person, in this case, these guys are all writing a biography of Jesus, um, you're not going to tell every single bit about their life or like, you know, here's what they did year one here's what they did year two um you're you're writing one specific aspect of this person in this case that jesus is the messiah that he is the one to come this is so this is what they're focusing on so probably that's why we don't get a lot from jesus's childhood we don't really get a lot from jesus's adulthood either we don't hear really anything about him until he starts his ministry and so but that that's again kind of the rules of the of how ancient biographies work and John says at the end of his, if you're if you are curious about this, John says at the very end of his uh, of his book, his his, his is uh, 21 chapters. But at the end of the 20th chapter, he says, "I have written all these particular things." He says, uh, "If I were to write every single thing that Jesus did, I suppose the whole world would be filled with books." And it kind of makes me sad that we missed out on all these other things. We'll never know that Jesus did. But but John says. I did pick these ones specifically so that you would believe 
that Jesus is the Son of God. So that's that's really all they're concerned is they want you to know that Jesus is the Messiah and that we he is trustworthy and we are called to trust in him. So don't know exactly why they chose the stories they did and why they would have left out the stuff about the childhood, but that's that's my best guess, my best answer to that question. Hey, Jerry's watching and so is uh, Carol. Good to see you guys. If you have any questions this week, feel free to pop them in. We're going to get right into the next part of the timeline. This is my this is the end of our timeline series here in Whiteboard Wednesday. We are going to be looking now at the timeline of the book of Acts. And I'm going to try to do this. Let me see if I can do this justice. I'm going to make a map. Um, doo -doo -doo. This is... Man, it, it's not like if you were to look up an actual map. That's probably better. I could probably find a picture of an actual map. I'm going to explain what all this is in a second. <laughs> I'm trying to do... This is supposed to be Italy over here. I don't know if you can see see that come across. A couple islands in here. Here's an island. Here's an island. Here's an island. Uh, okay. And then... Now... Let me, I'll label these in a second here. Now, this might look familiar over here because we've been, we've been looking at this, this little piece of the, the, uh, this area over here, rather. We've been looking at this the last few timelines. The Old Testament all the way through to the New Testament in the, in the life of Jesus. Remember, um, Galilee is up, up here by the Sea of Galilee. And then Jerusalem is down here by the Dead Sea. I'm going to make sure you guys can see that. Is that coming across? You guys can see it okay. All right, so here's Jerusalem. Um, so now we're looking at the book of Acts, and it's going to start, it's kind of interesting. The Old Testament uh, starts throughout the whole known world, and it goes, everything works toward this holy land, the promised land. And the whole Old Testament's the story of kind of going to the promised land. And then the New Testament is the story of everything in the promised land in Israel going out to all the world. And so that's the story of Jesus and, and the book of Acts. Let's see if I can clear these. That's fun. All right. Uh, so, so we're in the book of Acts here. Let me label a couple of these things here, some important areas. Tell you what, this is all water. Uh, yeah, next time I'll bring up a picture. Maybe I can draw on a picture. I'm still learning all this stuff. Had audio issues a little bit last week. I appreciate you guys uh, sitting through and listening to those audio issues. I tried to fix them as best I could. I think it's a little bit better this week. Okay, so here is, over here is Greece. Oops, Greece has two E's. And over here is Italy. And this is Rome here is the capital. That'd be the capital of the known world at the time. So even Israel is under the, uh, even Israel over here is under, everybody basically is under the power of Rome. Okay, but here, and here's the Mediterranean Sea. We, we've been talking about that. Anybody ever been to the Mediterranean Sea? Some people like to go on cruises in the Med My wife went there one year. Uh, she kind of took a trip down and looked, went to Greece and stopped a couple islands around the, around Greece. But here it's very, uh, here it's beautiful place to go. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. Here's Egypt down here. I don't know if that's too low. And uh, this little sea over here is the Red Sea that was parted for Moses. Okay, so all this stuff is still there. You can still go to it. There's a couple more. There's a couple more seas up here. I can't remember if it's a Caspian Sea. doesn't matter. All right, I'm going to stop. I get distracted. <laughs> I like just I like drawing on the screen here. Um, audio is good. Thanks, Carol. So what happened now at the, at the end of Jesus's lifetime? I remember he, uh, died on the cross. Three days later, rose from the dead. Tomb was empty. Now, uh, I said this last week, but, uh, so after three days, he rose from the dead. 40 more days, he's with his, uh, disciples and other people. He appeared to 500 people, including the 12 disciples and uh, 
and, and many of his other followers, 500 other followers. And after a period of 40 days, Jesus ascended into heaven where he has been ever since. Why we don't, why we don't see Jesus now. Uh, the resurrected Jesus is not here. He is in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father. That's what that's the ascension that happened uh, 40 days after the resurrection. Uh, as he ascended, his disciples were there watching him go. And this is now in the book of Acts. And they're still waiting for Jesus to take over Rome. They thought that the Jewish Messiah, who, G who they were convinced Jesus was, was supposed to raise an army out of Israel and go conquer the heathen nation in Rome because Rome uh, has everybody enslaved and the Messiah is supposed to free us. Well, here is Jesus ascending into heaven and uh, are you gonna, is now the time? Is now the time that uh, you're going to do it? And as Jesus goes, he says, just wait, just wait. I want you to wait and you, I will be with you. You'll see me. You'll, I'll, I'll be with you. And so they stick around his followers stick around in the city of Jerusalem, waiting for whatever Jesus was going to talk, whatever Jesus said was going to happen, was going to happen. Ten days after Jesus ascended, something really amazing happened. The Holy Spirit descended on Jesus' followers uh, like a flame and a dove. like a, They were like flames of fire over the, uh, the followers of Jesus in the city of Jerusalem, and they were filled with the Spirit. And the idea is the very power that was empowering Jesus is now empowering his followers and empowering them to continue the mission of Jesus. And the book of Acts tells us what that mission is uh, because it, it's quoting from the words of Jesus. Uh, spread to Go and preach the good news of the kingdom of God to Jerusalem, to Judea, so the city that they're in, out the, the whole country, to Samaria, even to the, the uh, Gentile world, or even to the non-Jewish world, and Jesus said, to all the ends of the earth. All the ends of the earth. So this, now the Spirit empowers Jesus' followers to do that. We're going to take Jesus' message, and we're going we're gonna to send it out. And so the book of Acts, if you're reading your Bibles, you've got the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Then there's the book of Acts, and that's the story of the Holy Spirit working through Jesus' followers, spreading the news to Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, and all the ends of the earth. That's, and that's why the book of Acts is written, to show us how that happened. Now, uh, so the followers of Jesus are filled with the Holy Spirit. And uh, they go out and start preaching the good news. And people are amazed as they go this, uh, as they go out preaching because um, they're filled with the Spirit. And as they're preaching the good news, people from other parts of the world, from other languages, are able to hear the good news in their own language. And uh, they're amazed by this. And um, the good news is spread. There's tons of people getting baptized. Everything's good. Hey, Rob. I went to high school with Rob. Everybody say hi to Rob. <laughs> good to see you, brother. Um, everybody's amazed by this. Now, uh, what ends up happening is uh, the people who wanted to stop Jesus, remember, who crucified Jesus, were still around. And they're frustrated because just a couple days ago, they crucified Jesus and they thought that this message would stop. And now here are all of his followers that are continuing the same message. Now, this is kind of unheard of. There were people at the time that, um that claimed to be the Messiah besides Jesus. Like Jesus wasn't the only one who pretended, or who pretended. Jesus wasn't the other, only one who claimed to be Messiah. There was a couple, uh, uh, there were people all over the place that were claiming to been, be Messiah. But what happened was they would raise together uh, a bunch of people, a bunch of followers, just like the early church did. And then uh, something would happen to their leader. Maybe he was crucified or maybe he was killed in some way. And what there was two things that happened either all the followers would disperse and say well that guy failed you know if your leader the messiah dies that's the end of your messiah turns out he didn't do very good and they, so they'd either disperse or somebody in that group usually a family member or something would pick up the mantle and say well now i'm the messiah and he'd try to keep the 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 thing going but people would eventually disperse these all these groups kind of fizzled out and died but what's up with this guy jesus and his followers they killed jesus but then the followers 
kept on with the mission. They said, no, he's not really dead. He's You killed him. I mean, he did really die, but he's raised from the dead. And that empowers us to go spread the message. They were frustrated they couldn't stop this message. So they bring in some of the leaders and they say, listen, if you're going to not stop, uh, the guy, one of the main guys was uh, the apostle Peter. And they bring in Peter and John and they say, listen, you got to stop talking about Jesus or same thing's going to happen to you. And Peter and John say, do what you can, do what you feel you have to, but we're going to keep preaching the good news of Jesus. And they do. But persecution sets out and it causes the church to have to leave Jerusalem. Lots of church, lots of people in the church stay in Jerusalem. Jesus' brothers stay in Jerusalem, and some of the disciples stay in Jerusalem. But most everybody else has to flee. And even though this is a bad thing, persecution and people having to leave, it causes the good news to start going out into all the world. Uh, one of the places, one of the main areas a big church starts is a city right up here. It's too big. Make it a dot. Yeah, right up here called Antioch. So here's another here's another church that starts in Antioch. You got a big church in Jerusalem, big church in Antioch. You got the churches over here. You got churches over here in Egypt. Now you got churches starting all over the place. Um, this makes the Jewish uh, elite kind of upset about this. Not all Jewish people. In fact, at this point in the church, it's almost all Jews. All the Christians are are Jewish still. Hasn't been a big push into the Gentile world. Well, there's a, a man who is a, a Pharisee, one of the up, uh, higher ups in the Jewish uh, elite, a guy named Paul. Take that back. His name is not actually Paul. His name is, his Jewish name is Saul. Or if we were Jewish, it'd be Shaul. Um, so Saul is a Pharisee, and he wants to put an end to this Jesus movement. And so he's going around and he's persecuting people, pulling, taking Christians out of their homes, uh, stoning them, taking before the Sanhedrin, and uh, and all the stuff. He's uh, really uh, kind of public enemy number one to the Christians. Something amazing happens. So Paul is sent out by uh, sent out by the Sanhedrin to get some Christians, and he goes from Jerusalem. Let me erase this here. One day, as he's going to the Christians in the city over here, Damascus, uh, Paul gets a vision of the resurrected Jesus. Now this surprises him because he thought Jesus was he thought Jesus was dead. <laughs> but this guy shows up and Paul recognizes this is the Lord. And he says, Wait a second, something is off with my theology here, because I recognize that this is the Lord. And, but I'm also realizing that this is this is that guy Jesus. So I am persecuting the followers of the Lord. That is, I should have been the one following Jesus this whole time. And Jesus says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul realizes he's kind of he's kind of on the wrong side. Has a, a great big uh, turning point. Have you ever heard that phrase, Saul on the road to Damascus, or Paul on the road to Damascus? Uh, that's when Paul gets converted and realizes the kind of the area error of his ways. Now I'm I'm kind of I need to speed up a little bit here. I'm going to I'm going kind of I'm getting too detailed. I need to give a, a birds more uh, bird's eye view here. Whiteboard Wednesday, but kind of rocks uh, Saul's world. And uh, as he's recovering in Damascus, uh, he. Uh, Well, I tell you what, long story short, he becomes a Christian. And he ends up in Antioch, here in the church in Antioch. And he becomes a Christian. He becomes one of the people, one of the very people he was persecuting. Now, uh, the first part of the book of Acts is all about Peter and what Peter does in the church and for the church. Peter gets an amazing, amazing vision from God because the church, like I said, is all Jewish at the time. And they are kind of sticking to spreading the good news to Jewish people. And it, it makes sense. I mean, if you're talking to the world about the Messiah, that the Messiah has come, a Jewish person would know what you're talking about. They're the one waiting for Messiah. But the rest of the world would have to, first you have to tell them kind of what the Messiah was and what that meant. So they kind of stuck around with the Jews. And the Jewish people always had this idea that the Gentiles, everybody who's not Jewish, is unclean. 
Well, Peter gets a vision. He actually gets the same vision three times of uh, kind of a picnic, a picnic cloth with all sorts of food in it that uh, on top of on top of this uh, picnic cloth. And this food is like food that Jewish people would consider to be unclean. And uh, in the vision, God speaks to Peter and says, what do you see here? And Peter says, I see a bunch of unclean food. And God says, would you eat that unclean food? And Peter says, no, I'm, I am i don't want to eat that food. I, that's, that's the bad food. I'm a good Jewish person. And God says to Peter, what I have made clean, do not call unclean. And Peter realizes that through the good news of Jesus, this the, what we would normally consider unclean, God has made clean. And Peter gets this revelation that the church needs to be going out to the Gentile and, and tell the good news to the rest of the world. Now, Jesus has said this before. He's been saying this all through his ministry, but it takes a while for Jesus' followers to understand stuff sometimes. But so it finally clicks with Peter, and Peter goes. Uh, so the first part of Acts is Peter realizing this and then starting to go into the Gentile world. Again, that's where the Church of Antioch starts. The second part of the book of Acts is now this guy, Saul, and as Saul becomes a Christian, uh, he goes uh, into, well, first he goes to Damascus, he stays there, he goes to Jerusalem for a couple years, and then he goes off into Arabia. That was supposed to be an arrow, but Arabia is over here. And he stays in Arabia for 14 years before going back to Antioch. So as some people get frustrated when God calls them to something, you know, God called Paul, or I, I God called Saul on the road to Damascus here. And it wasn't for 14 years later, maybe 17 years later, that he actually ended up doing something with his call. And some people, a lot of us are in that in that place where we know we feel like God has called us to something, we don't know exactly what yet. Well, maybe you're in that little 17-year period. Maybe it's going to take a little bit less. Maybe it's going to take a little bit longer. But eventually, uh, it'll happen. Just maybe... Uh, hold your horses. Get your house in order in the meantime. So, but in the meantime, Saul is uh, is called to go on a missionary journey with a guy named a guy from the church in Antioch named Barnabas. And the church in Antioch says we really need to go and send missionaries out into the world. So they get Saul and Barnabas, and they're going to go out into the world. Now they're going to go into Greek speaking world. And Saul is a Jewish name, and the Greek version of Saul is Paul. So sometimes in the Old Testament, God will change people's names. Abram, you're going to be Abraham. Sarai, you're going to be Sarah. Jacob, you're going to be named Israel. Um, and some people think the same thing happened with Saul, that God changed his name to Paul, but that's not actually the case. It's just his name was Saul, but he didn't want to go by Saul when he's speaking to Greeks because Saul in in Greece, in the Greek language, meant uh, small. So it kind of not, not a very fun, not a very good translation for the name of Saul. So Saul just went by Paul. So And that's what normally people call him. People call him Paul, the Apostle Paul. Uh, but here he is now going by Paul, and he's spreading the good news into the Greek world. So he goes out from Antioch, and goes to this island here. I think this is Cyprus. And he converts the governor here. And uh, it's going really well. He kind of comes up north here into this region. He and Barnabas into the region of Galatia. And he starts several churches along the way. Church, 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 church. And back to Antioch. Or I think he goes He goes back the way he came. I can't remember exactly. doesn't matter probably too awful much. But Paul and Barnabas come back. Now, uh, everything went so well that they wanted to go out uh, after a couple years on another missionary journey. Uh, so Paul and Barnabas are about to go out, but they get into a big argument. Uh, get into a big squabble, these two, Paul and Barnabas. Because Barnabas had a, a cousin named Mark, and this is the guy who, who wrote the book of Mark. And... Paul and Mark didn't get along. They had two different, we, we don't exactly know what the what exactly the deal was, but Paul and Mark did not get along. And Paul said, Barnabas, 
if you're going to bring your cousin Mark with you, I'm not, uh, I'm not going, basically. So <laughs> you say, these people really, these, uh, you know, Christians really argued with one another? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they did. And so, uh, again, what started as a bad thing, this argument between the two, actually turned out to be a good thing because uh, Barnabas and Mark went their separate ways. And they went on their own missionary journey and did their own thing. Mark ended up uh, writing, hanging out with Peter and writing one of the books of the New Testament. And Paul instead hooked up with a guy named Silas. And don't know much about Silas, but he uh, took him on this, his second missionary journey. So now Paul, he wants to check up on the churches that he started in Galatia. So he goes back. This is number two. I'll use a different color for number two. What is this one? Ooh, here we go. Ooh, look at how pretty that is. <laughs> so Paul goes through Galatia. He's checking up on his churches um, that he started over here. Uh, he travels through. Back then, this was called Asia. Asia is like a whole continent now, uh, way over here. You know, you know Asia. But back then, it was a little province. So when, when you read in the New Testament about Asia, that's what they're talking about, this little area right here. So he goes through Asia. He's starting up churches, uh, travels through here, uh, travels through Greece, and starts up churches here. And uh, a couple of the big ones he starts off that uh, we will read about later in the Bible is there's a church in the city of Philippi. The book of Philippians is written to them. There's a church over here in uh, Thessalonica. The first and second Thessalonians was written to this church here. Uh, he travels, he goes to Athens, kind of the, the capital of Greece, and uh, preaches to the philosophers and everything in the Areopagus in Athens. Very kind of fascinating um, speech that he gives there. You can read about it in Acts, Acts 17, his speech to the philosophers and the rulers in Athens. They had this uh, kind of, if you were a, a senator or a philosopher or something, they had this uh, amphitheater that you could preach your where you could uh, preach and teach from and argue publicly. And Paul went there and, and uh, got some followers there. Some people, a lot of people thought he was kind of weird. Uh, they didn't like hearing about the resurrection. They didn't like this idea of resurrection. They, they thought that the body was kind of a gross thing. And to hear that the body would be resurrected, they didn't like that. But some people liked it and they wanted to hear more. And, uh, and that was a good thing. Paul goes down here, preaches in Corinth. This was a very troublesome church. Uh, that he started here. They had a lot of problems, but uh, the book of 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians was written to them. Uh, then Paul traveled across the uh, ocean here, and eventually, oh yeah, this is Ephesus. forgot about Ephesus. book of Ephesians was written to them. And by the time I'm done with these Whiteboard Wednesdays, I, I see my screen is a jumbled mess. I look like I'm a crazy person. And then he goes back to, he goes back to Jerusalem, uh, and then back to Antioch. So that's missionary journey number two. And then missionary, then he waits a couple years and goes again. Missionary journey number three. It's kind of a rehash. Whoa, that's a weird one. That's a weird pen. I don't know if I like that. It's a little better. He kind of rehashes, he, he goes to the same churches that he, he started in the second missionary journey. So missionary journey number three, he's going through to all the same places, coming back. And he wants to go to Jerusalem one last time. And people, the uh, the Christians say, hey, it's it's getting dangerous in Jerusalem. You better not go into Jerusalem, Paul. They're not happy. Um, James, the brother of Jesus, has been killed. Uh, he's been martyred. Uh, the leader of the church in Jerusalem, things are not good there. But Paul says, I got to go to Jerusalem. I got to, I got to, you know, keep preaching the good news. And especially to my people, Paul had a big a heart to go to Jerusalem. And uh, lo and behold, after Paul went to Jerusalem, they took him in prison. And uh, and they, they chained him up at least for, for kind of disturbing the peace. And took him out of Jerusalem and he was in jail for a while. Paul goes, let's see, was there another, another color I could choose for? For this I'll choose kind of a this ugly brown color so now Paul is uh, in prison or enchained and uh, he appeals his case to Caesar 
he wants to uh, see his case before the throne. And so they put him on a ship and they take him all the way over to Rome to be tried on the ship. He, the ship gets into a shipwreck and they land on this, this island over here, Malta. But eventually they get, they get picked up again. And he travels to Rome where he's under house arrest in Rome. And then the book of Acts kind of ends. We don't really know what happened after that. Uh, some people think that Paul was got out of prison after he was after the book of Acts ended, and he goes back and and does some more things, does some more missionary journeys. Paul, we know that Paul wanted to go to Spain um, when he heard from Jesus that uh, we're to preach the good news to the ends of the earth. The ends of the earth in in their eyes was Spain, all the way over to the like the. The Straits of Gibraltar on the other end of the Mediterranean Sea. And Paul said, I'm going to take the gospel there. But it seems like that never happened. He wanted it to happen, but it didn't. Either he got out of prison and then was imprisoned again later, or he was just, uh, he never did get out of prison. We don't exactly know. But um, Emperor Nero eventually came and uh, had his head chopped off. That was the end of Paul. But that's the end of the book of Acts. That's kind of the timeline how the church spread out from Jerusalem into all the known world at the time. And some of the other apostles went out went out east. Philip went out east and uh, some of the other guys and started churches out as far as India. It's pretty, uh, pretty incredible. And from here, uh, the message of Jesus went out into all the world. All these churches kept on spreading the good news and they were filled with the Spirit. And they went out and told other people and the churches grew and here we are today. Kind of doing the same, doing the same mission, still following the uh, the command of Jesus to spread His teaching to all the ends of the earth. So that's what we're doing here. Well, I think that's it for the for our timeline series. After after the Book of Acts in the Bible, you'll get a big long series of Paul's letters, a, co a collection of Paul's letters. Uh, Romans is the first one. He wrote that to the church in Rome. First and Second Corinthians, you can read his letters to all these churches, and that's uh, that's what makes up a, a lot of our New Testament. Maybe I'd say a quarter of our New Testament is uh, is that kind of stuff. After Paul's letters, you'll get some letters from some of the other apostles. You get a couple from Peter, a couple from John, uh, one from James, Jesus' brother who was killed in Jerusalem, uh, one from Jude, Jesus' other brother named Jude, who was uh, who was also apparently a leader in the church. We don't know much about him, and uh, finally. Uh, uh, the Bible caps off with the book of Revelation. Oh, we should do the book of Revelation. That'd be a good whiteboard Wednesday. Maybe uh, maybe in the next couple weeks we'll do uh, the book of Revelation, what that's all about and, and how that's all broken down. That'd be an exciting one. But for now, this is uh, this is where we're at. If you have any questions, feel free to text me or, or pop them in there, and I'm going to let you get going. Uh, try not to worry too much about uh, what's going on. We're, let's, let's try to have peace in this crazy world, and uh, certainly having peace helps us be good witnesses and good missionaries in our own uh, in our own um, you know mission field that God has called us to. So, love you guys. Pray for you guys. Have a good one. We'll see you sometime soon. Oh, hey, uh, this Saturday, don't forget a harvest party. We're having a harvest party at the church. Invite your friends. We got uh, hay rides gonna happen. Uh, we have free pumpkins. Get your pumpkins here. Uh, it's Saturday. Don't buy pumpkins. Get them from us. We got some great pumpkins. We'll have some cider, some hot chocolate. We'll have some candy for the kids. We'll have trunk or treating for the kids. So who knows what's going to happen with uh, with Halloween this year. But get the kids down and we'll do some trunk or treating. Harvest party from 4 to 6. Invite your friends. We got something on Facebook here saying it's here. So be sure to share that and uh, let people know that's happening. It's going to be a good time. And hope to see you guys there. All right. Love you guys.